Good morning. Today we celebrate the 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Under the leadership of the Capuchin Franciscan Friars and in union with the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Philadelphia, St. John's welcomes all who present with us today in praising God and serving God's people. In this Eucharist, we remember specially Father's Day Novena Intentions. Our celebrant is Father John McClasicky. As we are about to begin the liturgy, please turn off or silence all paging devices, cell phones, or any other devices that may be a cause of disruption or distraction. Thank you. is found in the hymnal number 550, Sing a New Song, 550. Please stand. Spirit. The grace and peace of God our Father, the love of Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome. It is great for us to be here, great for our parishioners to be here, great for our secular Franciscan community to be represented here. Uh, they will be meeting after Mass, and at the end of Mass I will ask them to process out with me so that you can, uh, you can ask any questions about who these people are, these Franciscans vowed and promised to the Franciscan life, living secular lives in the world. And also, uh, we thank and welcome people who are visitors to the church, either from the, elsewhere in the Delaware Valley, or people who are coming to us from around the country and fairly often around the world. As we prepare ourselves to worship together this morning, we begin by acknowledging our sins and God's gracious mercy. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
us pray. through the grace of adoption, chose us to be children of light. Grant, we pray, that we may not be wrapped in the darkness of error, but always be seen to stand in the bright light of truth. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the first book of Kings. The Lord said to Elijah, You shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, as prophet to succeed you. Elijah sat out and came upon Elisha, son of Shaphat, as he was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen, he was following the twelfth. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak over him. Elisha left the oxen, ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and mother goodbye and I will follow you. Elijah answered, Go back. Have I done anything to you? Elisha left him, and taking the yoke of oxen, slaughtered them. He used the plowing equipment for fuel to boil their flesh, and gave it to his people to eat. Then Elisha left and followed Elijah as his attendant. The word of the Lord. My soul rejoices, my body. 
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Brothers and sisters, for freedom Christ set us free. So stand firm and do not submit again the yoke of slavery. For you were called for freedom, brothers and sisters, but do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather, serve one another through love, for the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you go on biting and devouring one another, beware that you are not consumed by one another. I say then, live by the Spirit, and you will certainly not gratify the desire of the flesh. For the flesh has desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you may not do what you want. But if you are guided by the Spirit, you are not under the law, the word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. When the days for Jesus being taken up were fulfilled, he resolutely determined to journey to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On the way, they entered a Samaritan village to prepare for his reception there, but they would not welcome him because the destination of his journey was Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they journeyed on to another village. As they were proceeding on their journey, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. And to another he said, follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. But he answered him, let the dead bury their dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me say farewell to my family at home. To him, Jesus said, no one who sets a hand to the plow and looks to what was left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord.
Well, it's been quite a week and promises to be quite a week in the future. I'm not going to talk about that directly or for that matter, even indirectly. But I will ask the question, what does God want from us? We may also ask ourselves, what do people want from us? You know, usually in life, we want clarity. Sometimes we get it. But so often in human relationships of all types, we're left wondering, what does she really want? What is he trying to say? How do I please them? What can I do? Just tell me what's on your mind. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. When we don't understand what is being asked of us, we can become anxious and there's a great likelihood for misunderstandings and disappointments. In our faith lives, in our spirituality, we also want clarity. And we do get some clarity, certainly, on the big questions, we get it. But if we, desire, if we pursue the desire for clear answers too far, it can lead us to fundamentalism, to biblical literalism, to dogmatism, and to a form of certainty that does not respect God's freedom to act in our lives. God gives us the gifts, the tools of reason. He's given us his self-revelation. And he gives us stories. Stories in the Bible that tell us things that happened but that are given to us not so much to, to learn the specific facts of this and that, as much as stories that are designed to make us think. Stories that should prompt us to ask questions about our lives. And the scriptures we have just heard are full of stories. The great prophet Elijah is near the end of his life, roughly 900 years before Jesus, and he's told to go anoint as his successor a young man, a farmer. And so Elijah comes up to Elisha and throws his cloak over his shoulders and begins to walk away. Think of that as giving the keys as you retire, giving the keys to the next person who is taking your job. And Elisha wonders what the heck is going on. He's made a decision. He's got to make a decision. Do I follow this renowned prophet? Do I believe what he has just done to me or not? And Elisha decides to follow Elijah. And just to be sure, to make sure that he isn't going to backtrack and change his mind, this farmer destroys the tools of his trade. He takes the yoke off the oxen and he burns it. He slays the oxen and cooks the meat and gives it to people. He cannot go back. He cannot go back. He is all in. There is no possibility of backsliding. Have you ever committed yourself that way? Have you created the conditions that prevented you from ever going back? Did you do it when you were married? Did you do it when you had children? When I gave away every cent I had to make vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience as a friar, did I do it? Or did I hold something back? When you were baptized, when you were confirmed, when you were professed as secular Franciscans, 
for you all in. In story after story in the Bible, God gives us examples of women and men who went all in, in their commitment to God. And we also have stories of men and women who hopped back and forth, first committing themselves and then, you know, changing their minds or incorporating some things. Uh, Solomon is the big example of this. All in in the beginning and then setting up shrines to worship false gods more and more as time went on. And of course we have stories about those who flat out refused to commit themselves to God and instead committed themselves to something else. St. Paul writes about these folks in his letter to the Galatians. All this talk about being free or being under the Old Testament law of being in the spirit or being in the flesh, of loving our neighbor or, in his wonderful word, biting and devouring one another. He's talking to people in church about church, biting and devouring one another. All this talk is meant to sketch out the alternatives. Choose Christ. Choose Christ's saving grace. Or choose something else. One or the other. Decide. Make up your minds, he says. Choose Christ. Live your choice completely. Do we judge and condemn others? In the gospel, the apostles James and John try to persuade Jesus to send fire and brimstone down on this Samaritan town that would not welcome them. And Jesus says, no. He'll have none of it. He will rebuke him, rebuke those apostles. He just moved on. Do we perhaps see ourselves in James and John? How good it feels sometimes when we speak harshly, when we condemn others. But that's not the Jesus way. If we're all in with him, we don't speak harshly. We don't condemn. We don't lose our composure or let the apparent sins of others destroy our inner peace. And at the end of this gospel, there are three more stories. I want to follow you, Jesus, one man says. But Jesus tells him that this means traveling rough without a home on earth. We don't know what that man shows, but how willing are we to give up some things to follow Jesus? Are we willing at all? Another man says, I'll follow you after my parents have died, but not right now. In other words, I'll follow you when the time is right. I'll go all in when the circumstances are more favorable, when other things fall into place. Do we say to ourselves, I'll follow you, Lord, completely when I'm older, when I'm richer, when I'm more secure? Then, Lord, I'll follow you. St. Augustine has, has this wonderful quote, Lord, make me chaste and pure, but not yet, not yet. then I'll follow you. And Jesus is pretty insistent. Follow me now. And that last man said something similar. And Jesus responds with this allusion to the Elijah, Elisha story. No one who starts to follow him should try in thought or deed to go backwards. Anyone who sets his hand to the plow and turns back, is not worthy of the kingdom of heaven. St. Francis quoted that verse. He put it in the rule for friars. Are we sometimes spiritual and sometimes not? Do we practice the faith outwardly and all the while in our minds remember too fondly and long for 
what went before. Religion and spirituality, if well, li well lived, need to focus on questions. Yes, we have the certainties, but for us, our spirituality, our life, our life in faith has to grapple with the questions. And these stories are always there to ask us questions. The questions for us in these stories is all about commitment. How willing are we to commit ourselves? Or are we hedging our bets, feathering our nests, trying to balance between the Jesus way and another way? And if we're trying to hop back and forth, sometimes following the Jesus way and sometimes not, we will never find a story in scripture where that ends well. You'll find many stories in scripture where people sin and then repent, but we will never find, find a story where anyone is praised for straddling the fence. A line from the Liturgy of the Hours frequently said, if today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Follow the Lord. Let us stand to profess the faith. our needs before the Father in faith. We know that he has sent his Son to go before us and called us to follow him. With confidence, we pray. Our response is, Lord, hear our prayer. For the leaders of the church and all those engaged in preaching the word of God, that they may persevere in their commitment to follow Christ. In faith, we pray. Lord, hear our prayers. For our nation divided over the Supreme Court's overturning Roe versus Wade, that protests do not become violent or destructive. In faith, we pray. Lord, hear our For each of us joined together through Christ in the Eucharist, may we be actively concerned about the poverty and suffering of our sisters and brothers and do what we can to lessen it. In faith we pray. Lord, that those who are alienated from the church may be moved by our words and actions and the power of the Holy Spirit to return home. 
In faith we pray. For our beloved dead, parents, relatives, friends, and all who have died, may they be welcomed into the eternal joy of heaven. In faith we pray. For the intentions in our book of prayer and those that each of us offers now in silence. And for intention of the celebrant, remembered especially in this Eucharist, in faith we pray. Offertory hymn is number 381, Servant Song, 381. my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. O God, who graciously accomplishes the effects of your mysteries, grant, we pray, that the deeds by which we serve you may be worthy of these sacred gifts, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For through his paschal mystery, he accomplished the marvelous deed by which he has freed us from the yoke of sin and death 
summoning us to the glory of being now called a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for your own possession, to proclaim everywhere your mighty works. For you have called us out of darkness into your own wonderful light. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins, do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. John the Evangelist, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Nelson, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned here before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children, scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, 
Give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other a sign.
Lord, you